And all God's people said, amen. We sang earlier, all-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly pray and proclaim, you are amazing God. He is indescribable. There is no one else like him. I want to invite you this morning into a new series in which we are going to focus upon the incomparable nature and reality of God. I'm calling this series Unrivaled. We have a sermon slide, a series slide for you as we think about what we're going to consider in the days to come. The theme of this series is that God is without peer or rival. That he alone is God, and there is no one like him. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11 says, Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing wonders. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6 says, There is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and great is you, are you in might. And since God is without rival, without peer, We must also worship him with singular allegiance. If you are a Christian, if you are someone who has come to see Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and to to set your heart upon him and invite him to come into your life, to change you and transform you, God has set a, a claim to the domain of your heart and he wants your heart to be his exclusive platform. My heart is now God's throne. God's first commandment to the people of Israel was that they would have no other gods before him. And that first commandment is is a call both to exclusivity as well as a form of protection. Because whenever we give ourselves to some other kind of entity or being or spiritual power or idol or pretend God, we become disoriented. Everything will be off. And so this morning and in this series, we want to think about who God is and then align our hearts and our lives before him. So let me invite you to meet me this morning in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, the setting for this series will be the incredible dramatic story of Elijah the prophet. The ministry of Elijah is one of the most exciting and pulse-pounding plot lines in 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 the Bible. From his opening salvo that we'll see this morning to King Ahab, to his epic confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, to his sudden departure from earth and a fiery chariot straight into heaven. There is no one quite like Elijah in the Bible. He is the prophetic archetype. In many respects, he becomes the prototype by which all other prophets are measured and how all other prophets function. And what I love about the prophet Elijah, perhaps more than anything else, as exciting as his story was, was that the thing that motivated him, the great ambition of his life, was nothing less than the glory of God. At one point, he was asked, who are you? Why have you been doing what you've been doing? And he says, because I have been very jealous for the the Lord, for the God of Israel. It was his passion for God that is the most amazing quality in his life. His heart burned when God's name was trampled. The epitaph that is engraved on The tomb of John Knox, that Scottish preacher, could have been written over the life of Elijah. Here lies a man who never flattered nor feared any flesh. That was Knox. That was Elijah. And as impressive as Elijah's life was like, our, our goal in looking at his life and ministry, though, was not to become preoccupied with Elijah, but we want to see what preoccupied him, and that is the superiority of God over all of life. 
So with your Bibles open to 1 Kings 17, let's just notice this morning the first six verses. Now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there will be neither dew nor rain these years except at my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. How exciting is that? And so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Kareth, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook, to which I would add for a very long time. This is God's holy and inspired word to us, and all of it is true. And God's people said, obviously jumping into the middle of a book in the Bible is like jumping midpoint right into a novel itself. Because there is an ongoing story here, and the story of Elijah definitely needs a context. And, and so this will be a little bit of a history lesson this morning, too, if you like history. If you don't, it's going to be a history lesson anyway. <laughs> but he appears on the scene during one of the darkest periods in Israel's history, so that the now of verse 1 of chapter 17 kicks off where Chapter 16 ended with a sad, sad story of spiritual seduction. It is a tedious section of Scripture, especially all of chapter 16, because we are in the 9th century B.C. It was just back in 1 Kings chapter 8, and you don't need to turn there, but it was just back in chapter 8, so not very far from where we are in chapter 17 now, that Solomon has dedicated the temple of God in Jerusalem. It is just a few years since, about 100, but relatively speaking, that's few, when the queen of Sheba visited Solomon in Jerusalem and saw the marvels of his kingdom. It wasn't that long ago. The older I get, the less a hundred years seems so far away. The reign of Solomon ended with his death in chapter 11. After his death, though, the kingdom of Israel was split into two, into a northern and southern part, and the northern kingdom retained the name Israel and consisted of larger territory and more tribes, ten of them to be specific. The southern kingdom was much smaller. It had Jerusalem, but it also just consisted of two other tribes. The northern kingdom, though, which will be our focus in this series, had a horrible succession of just rotten kings. A total of 19 to be exact, but for the first 58 years after Solomon, The first seven kings of Israel, starting with Jeroboam, were a pretty pathetic bunch. Since another king was ruling in Jerusalem, where the temple stood, Jeroboam, again now in the north, decides he must build at least a center for religion opposite from Jerusalem. And to make things a little bit more accessible for his people, because they were much larger in terms of territory, he built a couple of shrines. One in Bethel, which would be around the heart, the center of of the northern kingdom, and then one further to the north in Dan, he he built shrines. And get this, put up golden calves. wonder where they got that idea, to worship. Bethel and Dan became the destination for a false religious system that sets into motion everything that follows. Jeroboam was succeeded by Nadab, who ruled for one year, and he was assassinated by Basha. Basha was followed by Elah, who reigned for one year and was assassinated by Zimri. Um, Zimri was king for one week. Before committing suicide by burning the royal palace with him inside. So again, the historical record is a pretty tedious and boring summary of this period while showing that with each regime, what happened was, was that depravity just got worse and worse because that's how sin works. 
it metastasizes and just spreads. And so there was a time of, of corrupt kings and wicked priests. So that the first seven kings of Israel were this motley crew of assassins and drunks and idolaters. Each one worse than the last. And that brings us kind of close to the end of chapter 16. The next king was Omri, who founded the city of Samaria and built a new capital. And, and Omri was a rather skilled administrator. He had amazing building projects all over the country. But it's interesting that while historians, secular historians, writing outside of the Bible, sing his praises. And I was reading recently A New History of the World by Simon Seabag Montefiore in which he said, really, all of the accomplishments that we give to Solomon were actually the accomplishments of Omri. He's wrong, dead wrong about that. But it's interesting that even today, historians sing the praises of Omri, but when we read the, the words of the sacred historian here in 1 Kings 17, he gets eight verses. That's it. He's not very impressed, that is the sacred historian, because God himself was not impressed with this king. The focus was not on his achievements, but how he plunged Israel into idolatry, and that it all started with Omri wanting in on the lucrative trade that came into the Mediterranean port and then went off to Damascus and to other places. And he wanted a, a political ally with whom he could forge a trade alliance with. And so he found one and a man by the name of F. Baal. That's his full name. F. Baal, the king of Tyre. And Omri and, and F. Baal formed an alliance in which F. Baal gave to him in this alliance his daughter, to be married to his son Ahab. And the name of that daughter was Jezebel. And when Jezebel arrived in Israel, she brought with her her top god, her chief god, a god by the name of, well, following her father's name, Baal himself. So it was Ahab, jacked up by Jezebel, who then gives Baal unquestioned status in terms of his deity. And when eventually Ahab becomes king, he builds for Baal a house right in the middle of Samaria. Jezebel then proceeds to murder 850 prophets of God and in their place set up a fleet of, the, of their own prophets. So as, as Jezebel was getting her way, the true worship of God in Israel was being almost entirely shelved. So that we then read at the end of 1 Kings chapter 16, Ahab is the king for 22 years. We read this punctuation to his reign, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Jezebel introduces Baal worship. Ahab goes full headlong into it. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah, which was the female counterpart to Baal. And Ahab did more, hear this, to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And his, in his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. All of that was about the fact that once Jericho was conquered by the Israelites, God said it should never be rebuilt. And in defiance of God's word, Ahab and his cohorts rebuilt it. So what Ahab actually did was just, re, just initiate a re of the promised land. And as the seventh king of Israel, Ahab led the nation of Israel to the point of complete wickedness. There are some places in the Bible that we could turn to this morning to say that God at times sets a ceiling on the amount of sin a nation can get away with until judgment falls. God has set a limit. Sometimes we may wish that limit to be a little bit lower. 
It seems in Israel, God had a pretty high ceiling for a while because he allowed this mess to go on for quite a while. But now with the ministry of Elijah, God says, enough, enough. Before we move on to to Elijah, though, let's just back up and get a sense of who this Baal thing was, was and what he was all about. During my sabbatical, Lisa and I spent about five hours one day at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. What, a, what an amazing, fascinating place with so many of the archaeological discoveries. But we saw there a little statue of Baal dating from the time of, of the Israelites. There he is. How about that for a god to worship, huh? He was probably just a little household god that represented in some form Baal. But Baal was to the Canaanites what Zeus was. Uh, to the Greeks, he, he is the chief god in the Canaanite pantheon. He was the god who rides on the clouds. They called him the sky god. And just across Israel's border to the north, around Syria, was a, an ancient city known as Ugarit. And Ugarit really, in many respects, was was Baal's home turf. By the way, it's that area from which Jezebel came. And in this area, what's interesting is that the language there was very similar to Hebrew. So there was something of a crossover between the tongues. But a story from Ugarit describes how Baal became the king of gods by defeating a raging sea monster and earning the reputation for possessing power over the unpredictable forces of nature. And so he becomes the god of fertility and the god of rain and the god of storms. And and it was believed that he would be the god of agriculture that would allow a city or a country to flourish. And there's actually a text from from a Ugaritic book that says the heavens rain oil, the waters run with honey. So I know that the mighty one Baal lives, lo, the prince, the lord of the earth exists. That's just right next door to Israel. And so you can understand now that when Jezebel brings that with her and she brings her own books with her, it begins to take hold. So that the seduction of Baal worship was such that While God himself says, have no other gods before me, the thing about Baal and the thing about any idolatry is it's happy to coexist with other gods. And so a syncretism just settled in. There were some people who went fully into Baal worship. There were other people who said, you know, I can worship both God and Baal. I'm cool with that. And so in Baal worship then, there was this combination of the worship of God, but it's a fatal flaw. You see, the Achilles heel throughout the history of Israel. And friends, it's the same fatal flaw that exists for us today. Is that they did not stop worshiping God entirely. They just stopped worshiping him exclusively. And God wants pure, unadulterated, undiluted worship from his people. And so the Israelites were were repeatedly warned if they turn to other gods and they practice idolatry, they will violate their covenant with God and God will come and judge them. So Israel plunges into idolatry. It was fast. It was indulgent. It was spurred on by its leadership. It was a time not unlike our own, which is why we're looking at this this story for the next few weeks. Elijah lived in a time not unlike our own. It was a bleak time for a believer. And though we think we're very different from an ancient culture that worshiped many, many gods, we have gods of our own personal autonomy, self-expression, be who you are. Even the God of science, I think science is such a vital, valuable discipline, but we sometimes take it as if it's the ultimate. It's not. We have our, our gods of expertism, where we need to have the experts speak on, on everything. Politics even itself has become a religion for many 
beloved God is never surprised either in Elijah's day or in our day by the run of evil. And even when it seems like evil is on the throne and truth is on the scaffolding and God is suffering a setback, God is never losing. God is always on the winning side. He is just extremely patient, and I'm grateful for his patience because when he delays his judgment, it means that he wants more of us to come in, and I was a part of that more, and I'm grateful for that. But he has set a ceiling on the amount of sin a nation is permitted to commit, and evil never gets the last word. God always does. And when things seem so irretrievably lost, as they did in Elijah's day, and as they may feel that way today, don't despair because God, again, always gets the last word. And when Satan has done his worst and the carnage of all of his handiwork is is just scattered for every person to see, hear me, God is just getting started. Paraphrasing F.B. Meyer who said, when God begins, he can with one blow reverse all that has been done without him. And with the sudden appearance of Elijah, God steps in. And he steps in with a man who appears out of nowhere. And what I love about the end of chapter 16 and the 17 with the appearance of Elijah is that we really do move away from the focus on kings to the focus on prophets. And you got Elijah, and then you got Elisha, and you got the great prophets that are to come. And so here is Elijah starting it off, and he, he comes in like he's flying in on a parachute without any introduction, without any background at all. He just shows up somehow, whether he's in the court of Ahab or he bumps into him on the street. And he's got something to say to him. But the story of Elijah is the story of how God often chooses the most unlikely individuals to accomplish his purpose. Elijah wasn't thinking, boy, I can't wait till God sees me and spots me and knows that I'm the one he's going to use. Elijah was the last person God would think he would ever use. And you may feel as if God cannot use you. But he can, and he will, use anyone who is totally sold out for him. And so here he uses someone pulled from obscurity, living on the margins of the promised land, to speak to a nation in the midst of its demise. God didn't raise up an army. He didn't organize a movement. He chose one person whose heart was totally in sync with his own. And that's all that God is looking for today is one person whose heart is is wholly faithful to him. The world is yet to see. Henry Varley said years ago, what God can do in the life of one person who is completely committed to him. And all God is looking for is is for you to me and me to step into that kind of place. Well, Elijah, as we're told here, he's a Tishbite from Tishba. Nobody has a clue what that means, except it was somewhere in Gilead. That's on the other side of the Jordan River in a mountainous region. He was a guy who, who wore camel's hair as a cloak with a leather belt around his waist. He was the true mountain man, and he just shows up. There's no mention of his parents. There's no indication about his background. And here Elijah steps in and serves as an example of what God wants you and me to be like today. So in the time that I have left, let me give you three words. They're actually verbs that will define Elijah's life right off the bat, but they're also a clarion call to you and to me for the kind of person that God wants us to be. Three words to capture how we are to live right now, and here's the first word, stand. Stand. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, verse 1, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I, what? Stand. And you read it in its full context and, and you get the sense of it, don't you? 
that it refers to a man who, who is standing in readiness before a king, maybe like a soldier who stands before a commanding officer. Elijah stands before God, ready to hear him give a command, ready for him to issue forth what he wants him to do, and he is eager and ready to do whatever that is. We need to have a sense, beloved, that we are always standing before the presence of God, ready to do his will. Stand. Readiness, eagerness, whatever he says, I will do. If God says, jump, we say, how high? What do you want me to do? I'm ready. I've entitled this message, don't just do something. Stand there. Stand before his presence. Have a willingness and eagerness and readiness to do his will As we'll see in just a moment, this will be the source of Elijah's boldness. Where does does a person get the kind of courage that Elijah was, was known to possess? It comes from standing in the presence of God. And so Elijah stood before God like an eager soldier because he was convinced that the Lord, the God of Israel, lives. That's exactly what he tells Ahab. Not that we want to go back to that crazy quote from the Ugaritic text that said, Baal lives. Now Elijah says, no, 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 the God of Israel lives, and he is in control of all things. But the story even points to an even bigger story captured in the prophet's own name, because Elijah, his name means, my God is Yahweh. And though he's introduced to us without any indication of his family or his background or his mom and dad, his mom and dad must have been people of great faith, because they named their son Elijah, my God is Yahweh. What's your name, son? My God is is Yahweh. And everywhere he went, that's the message his name itself preached. So his name becomes his message. The dynamic of Elijah's life and ministry was simply the question, who is the true God? And we'll see that in chapter 18 when we climb to the top of Mount Carmel and we see that confrontation. Where is the God of Elijah? He is alive and he is well. And so his name becomes a billboard for the superiority of God. Don't forget that. God lives. He is not dead. God doesn't make a comeback because he is. And Elijah knew it in the depths of his being. He stands. Number two, pray. Pray. There shall be neither dew nor rain, Elijah said to Ahab, these years except by my word. You say, I don't see prayer there. We'll get there in just a moment, but he said that because he prayed. And really, that was his prayer. But notice those two words, these years. There shall be neither dew nor rain these years. Years. He didn't tell Ahab how long this drought was going to last, but the use of the words these years was a pretty good indication to Ahab this was going to be for a while. And it was going to be tough. Difficult times were coming. Food and water shortages would come. Drought, famine, inflation, even death. Why this? We'll delve deeper into it as we move along here, but remember that Baal was believed to be the rainmaker. He was the god of storms. He was the god of rain. And so Elijah's pronouncement here on, of a drought was the equivalent of a theological slap right against Baal's face. You think you're the god of rain. Let me tell you about the god of Israel who lives, and there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except at my word. Where does Elijah get that from God's word itself? So this was no random threat. And certainly, as you know, Israel's a desert, and so water is a valuable commodity, a rich resource there. Almost 3,000 years later from Elijah's day to her own, let me tell you, it's a very, very dry place. You visit Israel, you carry water with you everywhere you go. It was a valuable commodity then, and Elijah is challenging Baal upon his opposed or his supposed portfolio. 
It is a direct confrontation against Baal's power. Baal is not the one in control of the natural elements. He doesn't control the rain. God does. But why does Elijah say this? Because he is a careful student of God's word. There are places we could turn to throughout the, the Old Testament. Let me just give you a couple, and I think we've provided some, some words of this on the screen. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 5. God says to his people, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your rains and their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. That is, if you give me your full heart. Verse 18, and if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its increase, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. Where in the world did Elijah get the idea that he could just show up before Ahab and say, it's not going to rain these years except at my word, but he pulled it straight from God's word. Remember last week when we went to Jehoshaphat. And we heard Jehoshaphat pray when he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. A mighty horde, an army, a great multitude, one of the largest armies ever amassed in human history was coming against the nation of Israel. And he was scared to death. And so Jehoshaphat prays. And what does he pray? He obligates God to his word. Remember that? Somebody asked me last week, you sure about that word? I am sure about that word. God says through the prophet Malachi, test me and see if what I say isn't true. Obligate God to his word. He has said it, so therefore believe it. And so believe it that you pray for it. So Elijah, I don't know, he's reading through the scroll of Leviticus. And he sees there if the nation ever gives over itself over to idolatry, then God is going to shut up the heavens like brass. And he shows up before Ahab with courage, with boldness, because he's prayed about this, because he has read it in God's word, the careful student of God's word that he was, and he says, Ahab, is not going to rain. He so believed God's word that he based his entire existence upon it. He throws down the gauntlet. And he challenges not only Ahab, but Baal himself. There was no better way to attack Baal than to pronounce a drought. And so he does. Mary, Queen of Scots, also said of John Knox, I, hear, I fear more of his prayers than any armies that could be brought against this nation. I fear his prayers. I think Ahab would shake in his boots and says, I fear the prayers of Elijah. Folks, we need to stand and we need to pray. Let me continue to call you to this time of prayer over the next two full week days between now and the end of the month. And then finally, stand, pray, and obey. Obey. Christian life isn't all that complicated, is it? You can pretty, sum, pretty much sum it up in those three words. Stand, pray, and obey. The tough part comes in the living it out and, and the execution of it. But, but when Elijah hears God speak, what does he do? He acts. He does exactly what God says. The first the next five verses are simply unfold what Elijah did next. God told him to go to the brook of, of Kareth, which is east of the Jordan, and he goes. He just does what God's word says. Look at the number of times the phrase or the word word, W-O-R-D, is used in the first five verses. 
the word is dominating this section and it's dominating Elijah's life. And, and to read his life is to read a man who, who loves to be in on the action. And now God says, what I want you to do is, is leave the capital of Samaria. I want you to leave Ahab. I want you to cross back over the Jordan. And I want you to camp out by a brook all by yourself in isolation. This man of action who had such a hard time sitting still. He wants to be where all of the life was happening. How hard it must have been for him to go and sit by a bubbling brook and wait. But Elijah obeyed, and God provided for him. Again, Elijah serves as an example of what the entire nation should have been. God provided for him in a way that the nation would have experienced God's provision if they hadn't turned away from him. And so he's out there, and he's got all the bread and meat and drink he needs. I I don't know where Amazon is on the possibility of, of delivering our packages by, by drone. But let me tell you, Bezos has got nothing on God. We have got a raven catering service right here, bringing, bringing bread and meat every day. That's a little freaky, I know, dropping food from an unclean bird's mouth for you to eat. But this is God's drone service, and every single day, Elijah is experiencing God's grace in a new way. He obeyed him, and he goes. Elijah becomes the embodiment of God's word. Elijah says what God says. Elijah does what God says. It was all about his faithfulness to the word of God. Trust God. Believe his word. He represents God's word so that when again Elijah spoke, it was because God spoke first. And when Elijah goes into hiding, it was also because God's word was going into hiding. If he was the embodiment of God's word when he left and went over to, uh, to the brook Hereth, God's word was leaving the country. Let me tell you what happens if you don't value the word of God. He will hide it. He'll take it away. You say, I got 15 Bibles sitting on my shelf. They've been there for years. Uh huh. But if you don't value God's word, he will take it away. Amos says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. But they shall not find it. That's a scary place to be. Beloved, love God's word. Seek it. Savor it. Nourish your soul by it. We need it every single day. I have to quit. At the end of his book in the New Testament, James makes an audacious statement in which he said in James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man just like us. If you read his life, you sit there and go, say what? No, Elijah was unique, man. He was completely different. He was set apart. There was nobody quite like Elijah. And James says, no, he was just like you and me, mortal. The word that he uses there. He had a nature like us, his homeopathos. He had the same feelings, the same emotions as we do. What made him different? What will make you different? If you stand before him. If you pray according to his word. And if you obey whatever he says for you to do. And you, like Elijah, a man just like us, can pray. And the earth rumbles. And God shows up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this start into this study, not only of the prophet Elijah, but in your incomparable power and reality. And so, Father, we pray for this study, but we also pray that you will work a deep, a deep thing in each of us. 
really defined by these three words. May we be those who stand and pray and obey. The word of God, I think, through the prophet Elijah has not only given us a great example and a call for how to live this week, but it is a call to seek the Lord's face and to pray. You know, over the years, we have tried, we have tried a number of ways to encourage prayer during a service, after a service, and other places, uh, but But starting today, we just want to begin to use the very end of our service, not the close of it, but near the end of it, as an invitation for you to come forward. Maybe to bow here at the steps. Maybe it is to meet with an elder or a prayer counselor who is down front right now during the singing of this song, not after the service when people are moving in one direction and you're trying to come back this way, but right now. If there's a need upon your heart, if there is something you're asking God to do deeply in your life right now, something that you need, prayer that you need for someone to pray over you, we want to use this time as an invitation for you to come. Meet with somebody down here at the front, either by the prayer garden or off to my right, down here to the left. We have elders and others who are wanting and willing to pray. Whatever it is, the burden upon your heart, would you come? even as we stand and worship together. Let's stand.